So hopefully you've turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're taking a few weeks to talk about the subject of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, and also to talk about the subject of the Bible first to as spiritual gifts. We've been talking about that. We'll continue that today. It was five weeks ago, four weeks ago, today's our fifth week, four weeks ago that we began by looking at what the Bible refers to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We looked at that, and then the last three weeks, we've been looking at the gifts of the Spirit, specifically in 1 Corinthians. And uh, next week, we're going to finish our study on, on the, um, the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, as we do that, as each week, I, I, I've said that the big question is always, what do you leave in and what do you leave out? Because there's so much more. The best that we can do uh, over the course of a few weeks is just give a little bit of an overview. But if you want to go a little bit further, an excellent resource would be Living Water by Chuck Smith. Uh, I read this book first time 30 years ago. What I love about it is it's super simple to read, very explanatory, and gives a great deal of understanding. So if you want to go a little bit further in your study of the work of the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, and things like that, that's a great place to start. So we are in 1 Corinthians, and uh, you'll recall that Paul is responding to a list of questions that are asked by the church in Corinth. They want to get some things right, and so they have some questions. They've sent to Paul a list of questions, and he's responding. And uh, so we've come to chapter 12, and, and uh, as we, we, we get into this each of the last few weeks, we've been talking about spiritual gifts, and so we've answered the question, what is a spiritual gift? And so one of the ways that we've described that is a spiritual gift is a God-given ability to do something well, uh, a certain things well that we receive when we become a believer, and, and sometimes after that. But as believers, each and every one of us have received a spiritual gift or something that God wants to do in us. And the way that he does that is through uh, what the Bible referred to as spiritual gifts. And so again, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul begins his discussion on spiritual gifts. So if I could, just by way of reminder, as we get into this today, um, you'll recall that each week we've highlighted that when Paul began this book in the opening paragraph, he says there on your outline, he writes to this church, and he says, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. It was their understanding that Paul taught that spiritual gifts were given, uh, given to the church as they eagerly awaited the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We would refer to that event as the rapture of the church. Uh, this church understood that the gifts were given until Jesus came back for the church. So not, not for the first hundred years or until they received their first Bible, but the gifts were given as they eagerly awaited for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we began our conversation in chapter 12. And what I want to do is hop, skip, and jump through that to bring us up to, to where we're going to be today. But in chapter 12, you recall verse 1, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Some of your Bibles will say, I do not want you to be ignorant. And uh, one of the things that I've said is that if you want to do a fascinating Bible study, here he says, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant. There are four times in the New Testament where Paul says, regarding this subject, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. And what you find is that in modern church world, those four times where he says, don't be ignorant about this are the four subjects that we don't talk about in church world today. So the first thing we see here is, and I'll let you do the research and find out, find out those, but uh, he says, I don't want you to be unaware about spiritual gifts. Then we went down to verse four. And he says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. We talked about the plurality, varieties of gifts and how the Holy Spirit gives gifts to believers. And there's a variety of them, varieties of them, and they work out slightly different in each person. Verse seven, he said, but to each one, that's every one of us who are believers, is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So each one of us have received a, a, a spiritual gift, manifestation of the spirit, but the reason that we've received that is for the common good, uh, not just for our personal enjoyment, but it's to be a, a minister to the rest of the congregation, the rest of the body of Christ. And then you go down to verse 12, 
And again, we looked at this uh, the last couple of weeks. He says, for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And so together we make up the body of Christ. Our unique spiritual gifts reveal our part in his body, which is what he wants to use in us and through us as part of his body, again, for the common good. Well, I want you to turn over to chapter 14. So chapter 12 begins the conversation regarding spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, we went through that last week, and uh, that talked about the supremacy of love over the gifts, or we would say uh, that agape love that we talked about last week, that when we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, it needs to be operated in this agape love. And if it's not operated in that, it's, it's for the most part meaningless. So we talked about that last week. And uh, then we come to chapter 14. Now, chapter 14, what we're going to find is that chapter 14 is going to talk about the spiritual gifts uh, and and their operation in the church service. So I'm going to read verse 1, and he says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. We'll talk about that, but especially that you may prophesy. So I want you to write this down. And this will become more clear as we go. But the context of this chapter is going to be spiritual gifts in the church service. You want to write that down. And uh, I put a couple of the verses from chapter 14 on your outline just to drive the point, just to drive the point home. But in uh, verse 4, he will say the one who prophesies edifies the church. He's going to talk about what's going on in the church service. And then you get down to verse 12, and he's going to say, strive to excel for the edification of the church. And there he will be talking about the church service also. In verse 19, Paul will say, in church, church service, I prefer to speak so that I might instruct others also. We'll look at that verse. And then you get down to verse 23, and it says, if the whole church gathers. And again, this is all talking about what takes place in the church service. Now, the reason that's important is because when Paul talks about what takes place in the church service, he's going to say, this is what we emphasize in the church service. But that doesn't mean uh, some things won't take place in other venues. It just means this is what we focus in on in the church service. So in two weeks... Uh, During the 945 service, we're going to have a prayer and healing service in the old auditorium, and uh, there's going to be some things that would take place in that venue that would not be something that we would accentuate here within the, the church service, and we'll talk about that as we go. Now, the opening line, and this this comes from Sometimes when you hear somebody teach the Bible or they preach, there's always in the back of their mind the context of where they come from. So nobody ever gets away from that. We all come from a number of different church backgrounds. So when I was growing up, and we're going to talk about that in a a few minutes, but um, we were taught early on in church that we stay away from what the Bible calls the gifts of the Spirit, anything regarding the Holy Spirit, and and so we, we stayed away from that. Um, However, if you notice verse 14, here's what Paul says. He says, pursue love, and that comes from chapter 13. That's that agape love that all chapter 13 was all all, uh, talking about. Then it says, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So here's the question each of us needs to answer. As a believer, we're taught that we have received spiritual gifts. The question that we have to ask ourselves, and this we personally ask ourselves, uh, do, do we earnestly desire spiritual gifts? Or would you come from a church background like I do, where we were told not to earnestly desire, but to stay away from some of those things? So keep that in your mind as, as we go. Verse 1 and 2. Pursue love, yet, earnest, or yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse 2. For the one who speaks in a tongue, and I've underlined a tongue, does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. So we have been talking, at least referencing the subject of speaking in tongues over the last few weeks. And one of the things that we've said is that in the Bible, when it talks about speaking in tongues, that always refers to a language that the speaker would not understand. And so the, 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 if somebody speaks in tongues, the idea is that they would not understand that, that language. 
But the part that I want to uh, highlight here, and we'll talk more about the gift of tongues as we go, but he says in verse two, the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. So you wanna write this down, that tongues, again, we, we don't understand what we're saying when, when we do that, but is speaking to God, not men. Speaks to God, not men. Now that's gonna be important because if you've been around the church block, and we'll talk about that as we go, um, in some environments, uh, somebody will speak in a language, uh, speak in a tongue, and somebody else will say, I'm going to interpret that. And when they interpret that, what takes place, sometimes they'll say, here's what's being said. And they'll say, here's what the Lord is saying, my little children. And they go into this whole message as though it's from God to the congregation. However, here we're taught that when this takes place, it's not from God to the congregation. It's speaking to God. Does that make sense? So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but just keep that in mind if you're ever in another environment and, and, and you see something like that. So tongues would be praying or speaking in a language that I don't understand. That's always directed to God. However, verse three, but one who prophesies speaks to men, speaks to men. This is gonna be very, very different. You wanna under, underline that. For edification, exhortation, and consolation. So when it talks about prophecy, um, many times what happens is we, we read the Bible from the context that, that we grew up in. And in our culture, when we think about prophecy, we tend to think about like telling the future. So for instance, you're there at the grocery store, you come up to the cash register, and they have those magazines there that you know they grab your attention. And the National Enquirer is there, and it'll say the top 20 prophecies for the, the coming year. And, and what, what they would say is they would, they would hold that prophecy is about telling the future. And, and there's certainly a place for that. But here, um, when it talks about prophecy in this context, it's not talking so much about telling the future. There in your outline I put it, it says, a prophecy is more forth-telling the heart of God rather than foretelling. And uh, we'll talk about that. So on your outline, I put it from the NIV translation. It says, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So when... Um, and again, this is what's going on in the church service is the context. So if I'm teaching the Bible and um, I, I share something and it strengthens you in your faith or it encourages you to keep going, some of your Bibles will say exhortation, which is more, you know, keep going or, or get going, or, or something that gives you comfort, that would be speaking to men. And if it ministers to you, then, then what's taking place is it's the Lord speaking through to you specifically where you need to hear. That's the idea here in this chapter when we talk about prophecy. So the question, and so in this chapter, it's not so much about foretelling the future, but more forth telling the heart of God, the encouragement, the strengthening, and things like that. So here's the question. Can it be about foretelling the future? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there on your outline from last week, we, we saw in chapter 13, Paul said, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, the idea is things are being revealed. Uh, that's one form of prophecy. We talked about that last week. And in the New Testament, there is someone who is called a prophet. He appears two times. His name is Agabus. I put the address there. You can look it up, you can look it up later. But uh, Agabus appears two times, and he says, this is what is going to happen in the future, and it happens, just as he said. So it can refer to telling the future. However, here in this chapter, the emphasis is going to be more in the church service, the strengthening and encouraging and things like that. So the point is this, write this down. Um, prophecy is speaking to man, not to God. Prophecy is speaking to man, not to God. So, um, and, and this, this is where this totally flopped in the last couple of services because I, I talked about my church background and I said, have you ever? And they're like, no, never. So, so it's kind of awkward. So just play along if you, if you would. But um, I grew up in a context where they would say, we stay away from prophecy, that all ended. And then they would say something like, um, in the Bible, if somebody gives a prophecy and it 
doesn't come true, you are to take that person out and you are to stone them to death. So if you give a prophecy, you better know that it's from God or that you can be stoned. Has anybody ever heard anything like that? I'm, I'm alone. There's one hand in the back. Thank you. So, so, but I grew up in that. So we, we shied away from that. But well, where does that come from? Well, there on your outline from the Old Testament, Old Testament was written to the nation of Israel, very specific time, and uh, it says this, the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, God says, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So that was Old Testament given to the nation of Israel. They took it very serious, and it is something that we should take very serious. However, the New Testament is very different than the Old Testament. Old Testament, nation of Israel. New Testament, take the gospel into all the nations. You know, going forth, you're going forward and, and you, you've got God's spirit. But here's the thing. When, when you go forward and, and uh, very different than the Old Testament, you're operating in the spirit. The hope is that you always get it right, but sometimes you don't. But in the New Testament, you can't really, if somebody doesn't get it completely right, you just can't take them outside of the church and stone them to death. It's just, it, it's, it's very awkward. So you, you, can't, you can't do that. So what do we do in the New Testament? Well, here's what it says. It starts by saying, uh, Paul would say it like this, do not quench the spirit. You know, don't put out the spirit. Um, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but... Test them all, test them all, hold on to what is good. So, so the idea is that somebody with the very best intentions might say, hey, I think the Lord is telling me to tell you this. And uh, you don't just receive anything that somebody says saying that it's from the Lord. You test it. You see, is that really something that's for me? And if it is, great. But if it's not, you know, don't stone them. Just say, okay, well, that's, that's just not for me. The way that that worked in my life, there's been a couple of places. Um, back in 1987, I was with a, a group of four of us, and uh, there was a man named George Banchbox and, and, uh, and, and two other guys and myself. And we would meet early in the morning before we went to work, and we did this for nine months, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So at the end of nine months, what had happened in a two-week period, we were all going in different places. George was being transferred. The other two guys were going in different places, and I was going to seminary up in Indiana. And uh, so we decided on the last day that we would just pray over each other, just pray a blessing and, and, uh, as we go forward. So when it was my turn to be prayed over, I sat down and George, we, we laid hands on each other. George laid his hand on me and then there was Mose Nellen. He was my roommate from college and then Chuck Bowie, another guy from our church. And uh, so George prays for me. And as soon as George finishes praying for me, I hear the Holy Spirit say um, inside, not outside audibly, but I heard him say when Mose prays and then when, when Chuck prays at the end of that George is going to say, Dan, I have a word from the Lord for you. And you'll know it's from you because I've already told you that it's coming. There was the confirmation. So he prays, Mose prays, and then, and then uh, Chuck pr prays. And at the end of that, we're supposed to stop, say amen, then lay hands on the next person. But then George says, Dan, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I already knew it was coming. So God confirmed that before. And it was dead on. It was, it was completely accurate. So, so the Lord will always confirm Firm. And so, but you test it. One of the ways that you test it is let the Lord confirm to you that this is really for you. Well, verse four, he says, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. I've underlined that. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. So that word edify, I didn't put it on your outline, is oikodomio. And it means to build like a contractor would build a house is what it means. And so here he says, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So what that means is that speaking in tongues, write this down, is good for the individual. Good for the individual. It builds you up so that you can be used by God to minister to other people. In that tiny little book of Jude, just before Revelation, Jude says it like this. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit. So there he says, it builds you up in your faith as you pray in the Holy Spirit or how you build yourself up is by praying in the Holy Spirit. 
Verse four again, he says, the one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies, builds up the church. Uh, So tongues is good for the individual, but prophecy, write this down, is good for the whole church. It's good for the church. Both are good. Both have a a different function, but both, both are good. Now, as we come to to verse 5, I have to give you a little bit of context here, a little bit about my my church background. I'm going to ask you, do do any of you come from this type of church background? But um, so on my birth certificate, it says that I'm a Catholic, and and we didn't go to church the first five years. My mom marries my stepdad. And so at five years of age, we, we began going to the Baptist church, Southern Baptist, old school Southern Baptist. And, uh, and so, now, so if you don't know what that means, if you don't know what it means to be old school Southern Baptist, this is just what it means. It means that on Sunday morning, you have Sunday school, and that's at nine o'clock in the morning. Anybody remember that? Sunday school, nine o'clock, okay. And, and then you had church, and church was always at 11 o'clock in the morning. Sunday school, church, you went to both. Then you went home, You ate, you took a nap, but then you had to be back at church at six o'clock because we had training union. How many of you remember training union? Okay, yes, I see that. Good. All right, so then after training union, um, then you had Sunday night church. So we had four hours of church on Sunday, so we were getting a good dose. So, So then... You would come back on Wednesday night, but you'd come back at six o'clock on Wednesday night and you had the RAs, which are the Royal Ambassadors. Does anybody know what RAs? I see that hand, okay, a couple of hands. Now, you ladies, you would go to the GAs, okay? And, and uh, so the girls had their thing, the guys had their thing, and that was at six o'clock, but then at seven o'clock, you went to church, and then you, you went in there and then you had the church service. So, are we tracking together so far? Yeah. But, but then, okay, it's not over, because on Tuesday night, you came back, and you had the church-wide spaghetti dinner, and then you went on visitation. Now, visitation um, is, um, uh, how do I describe this, is the single most awkward experience in the history of the world. So, you, and the way this worked is, is that somebody would come to church on Sunday morning, and then on Tuesday night, we would show up at their house unannounced <laughs> to tell them how much we appreciate them coming to church and get them to invite us in and maybe make us coffee and have a completely awkward conversation about how we're so grateful they came to church. It really made sure that they never came back to church again. <laughs> and, and by the way, I believe that that's why we have gated communities today. <laughs> It's not the Jehovah's Witnesses. They got nothing on Tuesday night visitation. How many of you did visitation? Okay, yeah, okay. so we, we were there. Now, the other thing you need to know about my church background is that we were King James only. So what that meant is that uh, we didst spake King James. And that thou mayest knowest, I doth spake King James. Yea, verily. Dost thou speak <laughs> King James? Or are you NIV positive? <laughs> we dost spake King James. So in King James, we didst spake, but in tongues, we spake not. <laughs> we stayed away from that. So how many of you come from more of a church background like that? Okay, so what you need to do is you're going to underline the first part of verse five. So the first part of verse five is going to say, Paul says, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues. I don't think we ever talked about that in my church because we just stay away from that. So if that's your, your, your background, you need to underline that. But then what happened is that so we were Baptists, and then uh, we became, uh, we left the Baptists, we became Methodists, and then the church, we were, went through a church split, and then we became non-denominational, and then we became Church of God Anderson, so that's, I went to college in Church of God Anderson, and then I went to seminary in Church of God Anderson. There's six denominations called Church of God, so we were Church of God uh, Anderson. And so the first church that I pastored in, not the lead pastor, just one of the guys, um, was a very charismatic church. 
And so in that church, the emphasis was coming together at church, and we would speak in tongues, a great deal of speaking in tongues, and, um, and then there was the, the being slain in the spirit. Now, how many of you are familiar with being slain in the spirit? Okay, if you're not familiar with being slain in the spirit, you need to get out more and go check it out. <laughs> it's very interesting. So, so that would be the emphasis of, of our church, and, and so that would take place. Now, in that church, uh, when you have the slaying in the spirit, we had a ministry, and the ministry was called the Modesty Ministry. How many of you have ever heard of the Modesty Ministry? Okay, I see a few hands. Now, what that means, and for those of you who don't get out much, um, that means that sometimes the sisters in the congregation would get slain in the spirit wearing a dress, and so when they went down, you would put a blanket over them because sometimes more was revealed in the church service than the, than the Holy Spirit intended. So, so they did that. So if you come from a background where the emphasis was all on speaking in tongues, then you need to underline the next part of verse five. So the next part of verse five says, uh, so the first part, and I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but here's our part, uh, more that you would prophesy and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets that the church may receive the edifying. So, so the idea is that here, um, the, what we want to focus on, on what edifies the church, and this is going to be in church, would be the prophesying. But what is prophesying in this chapter? Well, the emphasis of this chapter, not exclusively, but uh, the emphasis in this chapter is going to be on strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So when we open the Bible and we go through that, and it strengthens you in your faith and encourages you, that, that would be prophecy. Not, not exclusively, but, but here that's the context. Well, um, verse five and six, uh, let me read this. He says, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so the tongue may receive the edifying. But now brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or knowledge or of prophecy or of Teaching. So write this down. Uh, in the church, we want to do what benefits the whole church. Doesn't mean other things are wrong, but in church, our focus is on doing what's best for the whole church. And so in some other venues, some things would take place, but we focus in on this. Verse 12, skip down. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. So that's, that's the focus. So Paul says, if I come to you and I'm speaking in tongues, uh, that's not really going to benefit. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's not going to benefit. So in church, this is what we do. Now, here's why. Verse 7. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, and producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction uh, in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? Verse 8. For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So Paul says, you know, if they, if they play the bugle and you don't understand what's being played, you don't know whether to charge, to retreat, or just come to breakfast because you, you, it's, you don't know what it's, what it's saying. So verse nine, he says, so also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken for, it, for you will be speaking into the air. So the idea is, so you want to just focus in on church. The main focus is doing stuff that, that ministers to the entire congregation. Verse 10, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of a language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will also be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. So again, this is when we come to the church service, that's the emphasis. And so um, very interesting, uh, not really part of anything, but the word barbarian in the original language refers to, um, the word barbarian in the Greek is just barbar, is just what the word is, barbar. And the idea is if you heard somebody and you didn't speak their language, that would be a barbar to you. You said, but well, there's a barbar, barbar. I don't understand them is what the word, word means. So I always just found that interesting. Verse 13, 
Paul says, therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I, and you want to underline pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? You, you, you want to highlight the I will. He's going to say I will four times. He says, I will pray with the spirit. That is, my mind will be unfruitful. I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit. And I will sing, I will sing with the mind also. So he says, if I pray in a tongue. So you want to write this down. Paul tells us that tongues is a form of prayer. You want to write that down. Again, tongues, a form of prayer would be from man to God, speaking to God. And he says, so what's the outcome? He says, well, I I will do both. I will pray with the spirit. That is, my mind will be unfruitful, but I will also pray with, with my mind. So here's what he's saying. I'm going to pray with my spirit, and I'm going to pray with my mind. Write this down. Paul is saying that praying with his mind and praying with his spirit are both valuable and important. He says, I'm going to do both. I'm going to do both. In verse six, we saw, don't turn to it, but he says, this, although this isn't really the focus of the church service. And then in verse 12, he says, so let's do what's best for the entire church. So when Paul says, I'm going to pray with my mind, I'm going to pray with the spirit. Um, he, when he says, I'm going to pray with the spirit, this is probably either another venue outside the church service or it's in his own personal prayer time so that it, it could be either. Now, Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit. Many of us come from a background where we will say, okay, I see it in the Bible, and um, I'm open to it, I believe it, but when it says, I will pray, they'll say, it's never happened to me. It's never happened to me, which which is important to highlight that Paul says, I will pray with my Spirit. Now, the reason that's important is because it's prayer, prayer will never happen to you. It's something that you do. So after the service today, you go out to lunch and somebody says, hey, would you pray for the meal? And they said, well, you know, I, I believe in prayer. I'm open to prayer, but, but prayer has never happened to me. You would respond by saying, well, prayer doesn't really happen to you. It's something that you begin doing. Does that make sense? And so praying in the spirit, praying in a tongue is something that will never happen to you. Paul says, I will. So it's, it's something that you do. It's not something that you wait to happen to you. Well, um, verse 16 and 17, he goes on and he says, otherwise, if you bless, and you want to underline the word bless in the spirit, And how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted? Now, how many of your Bibles say ungifted? Anybody? Okay, some of them, the the word ungifted is not a great translation. We'll talk about that word. Um, My translation says ungifted, but it's not a great translation for that word. How will the place of the ungifted say the amen? Amen just means they agree. It's hard for them to say, I agree, but they can't say. At your giving of thanks, underline that since he does not know what you're saying. For you are giving thanks, and you want to underline that well enough, but the other person is not edified. So here Paul says, you know, when you bless with the Spirit, he says you are giving thanks. You're just doing that with the Spirit, so nobody knows what you're saying. He doesn't deny that you're doing that, just that nobody's going to understand. So write this down. Tongues is a form of giving thanks to God. That, that's what it says. We're giving thanks. Again, the direction of that tongue would be from man to God. You're giving thanks to God. It's not God uh, speaking to us. It's us speaking to God. Some of our translations say, as mine does, it says there, um, verse 16, otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen? Amen. And, and, and so that word ungifted causes some people to say, well, I believe in it, but I'm one of the ungifted. I don't have the gift. That's not a great translation of that word. So what I've done is I placed, placed that verse on your outline and uh, from the NIV, and it says this. 
if you are, if you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand, that's a better translation, say amen or I agree to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying. But the word there for do not understand or my translation says ungifted, the word in the original language is the word idiotes. You just take a guess what English word we get from that. We all got it, right? So I guess you could say, so if you're praising God in the spirit and those idiots don't know what you're saying, I would suggest that's probably not the best translation of that either. The word idiotes just means without knowledge. They don't understand. It's not part of it. They, 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 you know, they're not clued in. So if you do that in church, they're going to have a hard time saying, amen, I agree, uh, because they don't understand. So the word there's idiotes, it means without knowledge, without understanding. Again, verse 17, he says, for you are giving thanks well enough. Paul doesn't deny that they're doing that, but on the, the other person is not edified. So verse 18. He says, I thank God, I speak in tongues more than you all. However, once again, in the church, and you want to underline that, in the church, because we're talking about the church service. I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct others. If you have the King James, it will say teach, which is uh, uh, equally good. I will instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul says, I want you to know, I do practice the speaking in tongues, but not so much in the, in the church service. So apparently that would be in his private prayer time, and we would call that a private prayer language, or in another venue, like if we had the prayer and healing service, that would be more than appropriate. And, uh, but here the chapter is, the context is just the church service, that, that's the context. And, uh, but, but before we say you can never speak in tongues, you know, in, in the church service, I, I want you to just notice how Paul closes this chapter when he closes this chapter. And again, this chapter is dealing with what we do in the church service. It's all over this chapter. So the very last verse in this chapter, he's going to say there in your outline, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Um, I come from a church background where it was for, forbidden completely. Um, but he says, don't, don't forbid that. So here's what he's saying. When you put all that together, write this down. It indicates that Paul refrains from, but doesn't forbid tongues in church. So it's, it just it wouldn't be the focus of what we do, but, but, um, but it's not forbidden. Now, the goal, the other thing that we're going to see in this, in verse 19, he says, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I might instruct others also, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. It tells us that in Paul's mind, that when he thought about the church service, he held, and write this down, the goal of the church meeting is instruction. It's instruction. Which is why here at Calvary, the one thing that never changes when you come to church, we open the Bible, we go through, we read it, we explain it, we instruct. It doesn't mean some other things are wrong. It just means that this is the focus of our church, of our church meeting. Does that make sense to you? Okay, good. So focusing in on instruction uh, during the church service is not in any way diminishing the role of the Holy Spirit because some people will say, we need more movement of the Holy Spirit in the church service. Okay, um, let me just give you a very quick Calvary perspective. We would hold as Christians that Jesus is God. The gospel is that God came to the earth as a man. He's fully God, he's fully man. Because he is God, when Jesus spoke, it was literally the word of God. Would you agree with that? It's the word of God when he spoke. So Jesus will say this there on your outline in John 6. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Then he says, and this is the part of underline, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. The word that he spoke, because it was God's word, it is spirit. It is spirit. It doesn't get any more spiritual than that. We hold that this is God's word. 
And when this is spoken, there's nothing more spiritual than God's word going forward. We would also hold, so, so here, we believe that this is the most spiritual thing that we could do in this context would be to instruct, to give God's word because his word is spirit. You can't separate God's word from God's spirit. And um, so they don't, they're, they're always, always together. We would also hold that if it's the Holy Spirit, if somebody's operating in the giftedness of the Holy Spirit, um, the, and it's really the Holy Spirit moving in them, we would hold that Jesus was the most spirit-filled man who ever lived. Who ever lived. So if Jesus was the most spirit-filled man who ever lived, then whatever I'm doing by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit inside of me should make me look a lot more like Jesus. Would that make sense to you? And so if I'm doing something and I'm claiming that it's of the Spirit, but it's not making me look a lot more like Jesus, you need to question that. You need to question that because he's the most spirit-filled man who ever lived. Well, did you find that at least interesting today? Good. So what we're going to do is that next week, we're going to go to the next part of 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to conclude our teaching on on the the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, there's so much more. But then in two weeks, here, we're going to begin the Gospel of Luke. But we're also going to have, during the 945 service, what we call a prayer and healing service. If you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we talked about the first week, or you would like to uh, receive or uh, reveal or experience some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that would be a great venue for you to participate in that. But it's also a prayer and healing service. If you need prayer for anything, uh, that's a great opportunity to be there. I encourage you to do that, and it, it's, it's available to you. And then we'll be here um, also studying the Gospel of Luke beginning that, that same day. Well, with that, we'll pick it up there next week. We'll go ahead and close in prayer. Join me as we pray. Father, as we close this today, we're reminded that you, you taught us to desire earnestly the spiritual gifts. And uh, so we want everything that you have for us. We want to do things that are appropriate um, in the church service. We realize that some things are what we emphasize, but other things are not forbidden in the church service. And, and so we, we, we get that. We want to be filled with your spirit, but we recognize that if we're filled with your spirit, it's going to make us look a lot more like you. And, and so that's what we want. We, wanna, we want to receive everything that you have for us, and then we want to operate appropriately in everything that you, you want us to operate in. And so I pray that over the course of the next week, two weeks as we consider this even further, that you would be bringing to our mind and, and sharing some things with us from your word and your spirit together and, and helping us to see some things that maybe from our church background, either this way or that way, was not really part of, of what we did. We want to be just in the, the right place before you. So we ask you to make that very clear and reveal that to us as we go forward. Illuminate our minds and our spirit as, as, we, as we consider Lord, I pray that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.